going. What an amazing uh, couple of days already and uh, already not going to plan. So uh, the, the departure from Point Cook uh, was, was really, really special. And I have to thank the, the RAF base there and, and the team members, uh, especially Gilly, for helping pull all of that together. Um, small crowd, about 40 people, but a, a dozen planes were there. Uh, we had uh, myself in the Sea Bear. We had the couple of Sea Rays and the Super Petrel that are going around Australia clockwise uh, together, uh, who'd been at Rothwell the night before. And uh, then uh, the RAF brought out a sop with pup and a uh, tiger moth to uh, put either side of Southern Sun for some photos. And they presented me with uh, an ensign, a RAF ensign, to take around the country with me, which I'll be giving back to them when we uh, have a presentation on Sunday, May the 19th, everything going to plan. So uh, getting out of Point Cook uh, went well, the weather was fine. Uh, I got down to Wilson's Prom and then as Wilson's Prom often is, it was wet and it was rainy and it was low clouds. So I, uh, I suspected um, having studied the weather that I could end up uh, in Yarram and that's exactly where I made, uh, made a track to. Uh, following the coast was going well, the live stream was going well. I could see people were following it because I, people were sending me photos of them watching the live stream on the big screen in their workshop or their home or, you know, while they were doing other things. So I'm glad that was working. And then, uh, yeah, look, I stopped at Yarram. I landed at um, Yarram. I did, of course, go to Corner Inlet, which was the first stop of the flight uh, by Goebel and McIntyre. They had a fuel leak. You never want to see a fuel leak on a plane. And uh, because they were a seaplane, they were able to just put down on corner inlet. Uh, that says they were only there for 10 minutes, fixed the leak and then took off again. And uh, I, uh, I did a splash and go. So you're going to see me use the term splash and go over the next uh, several weeks quite a bit. It's, uh, so if you're landing at an airport, it's a touch and go where, you, where you're training and you just come in, land, keep rolling through and then take off again. Well, in Waterworld, we, uh, um, we call it a splash and go. So, you, you know, the same thing. You come down, uh, splash onto the water, keep going and then take off. Now, I will say it once here, and I won't qualify this again for the rest of the trip. There are people who like to correct me and say, you are not landing on the water, you land on land. Uh, what you do on the water is you alight. So when you come down and touch the water or take off, it is called alighting. But if I use that term, most people will have no idea what I'm talking about. So I will keep referring to landing. And uh, if you were following that protocol of landing on land is landing, then why isn't stopping, uh, keep touching the water on water watering? So maybe I'll call it watering. No, I'm going to stick with landing. And the, it, the weather got a lot worse there for a couple of hours. The, it really cloud rolled in. It was very, very low, uh, certainly not suitable for flying. After a couple of hours, um, as we do, of uh, studying um, all of the tools available to us now, looking at weather radar on the phone and looking at weather apps on the iPad. Um, and uh, there were some people there from the airport. We're all doing the same. And, and then occasionally you just have to remember, oh, I'll just look up. Yeah, it's crap. <laughs> we can't get out. No matter what we're looking at on the app, the cloud is there in front of us. So, but after a couple of hours, it looked like it was going to be pretty clear down the coast. And I thought, okay, we'll give this a go. And, uh, but uh, after, a, oh geez, it was only about half an hour. I could see off in the horizon that it wasn't looking good. I've got the radar, weather radar in the plane. So I could see that uh, Bansdale was going to be the best place to go. And one of the good reasons for me to go to Bansdale is we actually have a cinema there. And so I knew I had somewhere to stay because we have this luxurious single bed up in the projection room that we have for emergencies. It was an unexpected surprise. Uh, but the good thing is uh, also Bansdale is a really, really well run airport um, as the uh, Gippsland ones are. And they have a couple of really big old World War II hangars that I know are generally empty and I'm, I've been given permission to park in there. And thank goodness I did because uh, as I was uh, taxiing, uh, I landed in light rain, but as I was taxiing towards the hangar, it just opened up and then it bucketed down all night. And the weather was so ferocious that even though I was well inside this hangar, an open fronted hangar, when I came back in the morning, the plane was covered in rain. Like as far, it must have been coming in horizontally. 
So I was very glad to sit that out and not have the plane outside for the night. So um, thanks to the team at Bensdale, you, um, you're always really helpful. Uh, so the next morning I thought I'd get going early, but the weather was still there. So I took the chance to do um, uh, a few of the little jobs. I've still got, you know, my big list of jobs. I've still got a few of the little ones that uh, I didn't quite get finished. So I, I did a couple of those in the morning and uh, by 11 o'clock, I was able to get going, uh, which was really good because I'd spoken to my mum. Uh, she was going out that day. So um, we thought rather than stop and have uh, a cup of tea, I would just uh, fly over, do a little loop and wave to her and keep going. And uh, uh, and then flying down um, past Lake's entrance, the cloud wasn't great, but it, it was probably at five, 600 feet. So I was able to just fly under that and follow the coast. And 20 minutes later, it all cleared up and, uh, then it was kind of beautiful flying down to Gabo Island. It's um, as a yachty, it always feels awesome to, to go around the corner of Gabo Island because when we've sailed from Melbourne to Sydney or back uh, vice versa, uh, that's a real landmark that you look forward to going around. Okay, so from there up to Eden, um, up this you know the beautiful coast. You know when you're at 500 feet, you can see such great detail. You, know, you can really clearly see the people on the beach, people on their boats, um, waterfront houses. Uh, you, you really get to take a lot in. Um, and then uh, I came up towards, uh, as I was going past Wollongong, I, uh, wanted, I, I decided I'd try and test the uh, in-flight streaming again. Now it worked really well on the first day, but then it wouldn't go again after I left Yarram and I, I was really worried I'd got water in it actually. And I, because of the rain, I, and it stopped working just as I was about to land at Yarram and I convinced myself that I'd got water into the system somehow. But I, uh, so I spent uh, the morning in Bansdale just making sure everything was okay. I pinched one of the blowers from the cinema. Um, it's in the hangar to pick up. Sorry, I forgot to tell you that. And so I used this blower to just blow it out. And, uh, and then anyway, after doing that for about an hour, it, um, it came on, but only for five minutes. And then I thought, ah, I think it's something else. So um, I left it off for the first uh, two or three hours of the flight and then turned it on and it came on fine uh, around Wollongong. So I thought I'll save, obviously what had happened is I just run the battery down too far. I probably should have given the battery a really good charge up before I left, but I'll do that when I get to Southport. And then, uh, so I saved the battery to make sure that when I got to uh, Rose Bay, I'd be able to turn it on for a live stream there. Now, if I was a better communicator, I would have sent out a text or a, a social media post saying, I'm about to turn on the live stream. I promise I'll do that in the future. But coming into Sydney Harbour is always, always exciting. I mean, the Opera House, the bridge, the just density of houses on the water is so exciting. And uh, yeah, it's only helicopters and seaplanes that are allowed to fly in uh, to, I think it's Romeo 458, uh, which is this restricted airspace. So. Uh, we can fly around there at up to a thousand feet. I, of course, went at 500 feet because lower is better. And uh, yeah, just love, uh, anyway, I've got some great images there with that live stream, which is uh, now saved to be watched later and I can use um, in editing together. But uh, then went over to Rose Bay, uh, did a orbit over Rose Bay and then did a splash and go in front of them, uh, which is where Goble and McIntyre originally landed for the night and they pulled the plane ashore and uh, you know, stayed in Rose Bay for the night. Now I'd already decided I wouldn't do that. I, frankly, I wouldn't really want to leave my plane on a beach in Sydney overnight, unfortunately. So, and I was also behind schedule. I was meant to be in the Mile uh, River by um, last night. So I decided to keep going. It was only just over an hour's flight to go up through Williamtown airspace, follow that, that amazing long beach and then come into um, the Mile Lakes system. Now, originally they landed on the Mile River because the weather was horrendous. The weather that you had in Sydney last week, they had a hundred years ago. They landed on the Mile River, having been flying at about a hundred feet to stay, uh, stay visual with the ground, put down on the river, and then were stuck there for two days while the weather uh, finally lifted. I decided uh, that, um, I would like to land on the Mile River, but I was only gonna do it for one night. But then inquiries led me to find out that it only has a four knot speed limit. So one of the things a lot of people wonder about um, seaplanes is, and what permission do you need? Well, generally you don't need permission to land on water. What you need though, is to follow the rules of a boat, because as soon as a seaplane touches the water, 
it becomes a boat and you have to follow the rules of boating. And there's a four knot speed limit on the Mile River. Uh, we land at about 55 knots, which is pretty fast. And uh, therefore that's out of the question. But the Mile Lakes feed the Mile River and is this, I mean, I haven't been here before. It's just this wonder ground. Look at this little cove. And I was really lucky that my very, very good friend, Ian Westlake, um, his partner, Sophie, her dad, Craig lives up here. And he uh, has been on these waters uh, for most of his life and said, there's a really nice little cove at this campsite. And uh, uh, what's the name of this campsite, Craig? Um, <coughs> Causeman's Landing. Causeman's Landing. There you go. For people who know this part of the world, Causeman's Landing. So I was able to uh, taxi in here. Um, Ian, uh, champion that he is, stripped down to his jocks and helped me uh, slow the plane down and spin it around. And uh, I've stayed here for the night. I've slept in the plane uh, for the first time since. I, now, the last time I slept in the plane on the water was actually on the Mississippi River in 2015. Uh, Back then it was in a sea ray where I couldn't actually lie out straight, so it wasn't very comfortable. Now it's luxury with the flying station wagon. Uh, today I'll be off to Southport where I'm staying for two nights. Uh, that's gonna give me time to catch up on a few things, a little bit of work, a little bit of video editing, and a uh, couple of little jobs on the plane, but I'm pretty much there now and uh, plan for taking off from there. So I will, uh, I'll will i be back in touch via all of the usual things. So. Please follow on all of the various mediums. Just go to southernsun.voyage to find all of the links and we'll chat soon. Huzzah.